Welcome. Everybody awake? Yeah. All right, I used to teach high school, so I tend to move a lot and make a harder target. So I have very much enjoyed the presentations of the numerous attorneys from various jurisdictions who gave us a very clear idea of their law, singular, for their country, singular, in 10 minutes or 20 minutes. I have 10 minutes to do 50 different laws. Because in the United States, parentage and how parentage is established through surrogacy is uniquely a state governed issue. The federal government defers to the state's laws. So every state has a different law, unless they've adopted a uniform law or something that is consistent with other states that have passed the same law. Now, Courtney has given a great overview of the use of statutes and the evolution of the law. I concur in the distinction between genetic or traditional surrogacy and gestational surrogacy. I think the trends that Courtney pointed out were essentially affected or influenced by those distinctions because BBM in 1987 was a genetic or traditional surrogacy case and the court had not had to deal with surrogacy yet and there was no way the court could find under existing law that a woman who gave birth and was the genetic mother and wanted to be the mother could really have her rights terminated against her will. After that case, while traditional or genetic surrogacy was in vogue, all of those states passed prohibitive legislation aimed primarily at traditional or genetic surrogacy. In that time, the conversion happened to gestational surrogacy, and then in 1993, the California court, in a case named Johnson v. Calvert, held that a genetic mother who couldn't carry had the tie-breaking intent so that she could be awarded parentage and that a non-genetic surrogate would not have parental rights. Thereafter, with the advent of gestational surrogacy and that reasoning from Johnson v. Calvert, slowly the momentum gathered, and as Courtney pointed out, most of the subsequent statutes in some form affirmed regulation of compensated surrogacy. So that is the trend in the United States. Now, the law in the United States that I have to apply as a practitioner starts from many sources. One are the state statutes, but standing over that is the United States Constitution. And our Constitution affects some of our perspective of surrogacy in the United States because we have a Bill of Rights and we have amendments in 14, 15, 19, and 26 that create a broad panoply of individual liberties and rights. And the sense of personal autonomy and individual rights in the United States is very deeply ingrained in the social consciousness. And that means people think they have the right to govern their own lives in many ways, in many forms. Now, one of the rights that has been addressed by our Supreme Court is the right to procreate. And in early case law decisions, the court has said that our 14th Amendment does give the fundamental right to procreate a protected status as a fundamental liberty. Now that case didn't deal with procreation through assisted reproduction, but it does say that if you want to procreate, the government can intrude or limit that right without strong cause. Now there was a case in Utah about eight years ago in which a statute said that a surrogate would be the parent if a surrogacy was conducted under that state's law, exclusive of the genetic mother's right to establish parentage. And the federal court, in an unpublished opinion, said that's unconstitutional, it violates a fundamental liberty to procreate, so in that initial case, the first time a federal courts looked at it, they affirmed the fact that the fundamental right to procreate includes surrogacy. At least it shows that the courts can cobble together an argument that that's the case. So that means that surrogacy essentially has a legal standing or leg up in the United States that it may not have in other places. Now, 
that state sovereignty that's set forth in the 10th Amendment of the Constitution means there is no federal regulation. All of the state laws are different. The processes are different. The types of surrogacies are different. As Courtney said, there are three general categories of states. We have a statute, permissive or prohibitive, or we have case law without a statute in some states that affirm or re restrict, or we have no law at all. So those practitioners in other countries that have their parents coming to the United States are gonna have parents that come back with a variety of documentation. California issues a pre-birth order, which is a judgment, which sometimes has difficulty even being accepted by the vital statistics departments in other states. So what the effect of that pre-birth order is, as opposed to a post-birth judgment in a process that includes an adoption, is different. In Illinois, it's an administrative process based on affidavits from the attorneys that give vital records permission to issue a birth certificate in the parents' names and establish them as technically or essentially administratively as legal parents. What kind of process goes on in the individual state is critical when they return and how it may or may not be recognized in the home country. So understand that that affects the, ver the view of what you as other attorneys are talking to your clients about and going to the United States. They have to understand that legal landscape. Now, in terms of the similarities, however, whether you get a pre-birth order, an administrative order, or some sort of judicial judgment after birth, in the United States, every surrogacy is subject to some sort of legislative structure and requirements and compliance or judicial oversight of some sort or intervention. A judge will look at the papers, a judge will have the parties in court. Something is being done to ensure the due process of the parties. And I think that may be a very important reason why the process in the United States is so reliable. In addition, among the United States, all of the orders of any individual state are entitled to full faith and credit in all the states outside the state that issues the order. So we are used to an idea that even if a state issues an order and enters a parentage order in one state, a state that has a different policy must still respect that. In our minds, that supports a process of international comedy so that orders issued in the United States with appropriate due process could or should be entitled to recognition in their home countries. And that may be one of the elements that goes forward in the commission report and dealing with international surrogacy, et cetera. So, in terms of the legal process, there is no single legal process. In California, with very few restrictions, you submit documents without a court appearance, a judge signs an order, upon birth, the parents are the parents, the birth certificate issues, and they have legal authority. In Illinois, the parties are represented by independent counsel, they follow the statute, the attorneys submit their affidavits at the end of the process, and parentage is essentially established. In Minnesota, where I practice, there's no law. So what do I have to do? If I have a gay couple or a couple where the mother can't provide the egg and I have a father who's the genetic father, I have to use laws that were established in 1983 to make them the parents. So first, in order to do this efficiently and send them home in three weeks, I have to establish the genetic father as the father. That's a paternity statute under 257 of Minnesota statutes. If I get a birth certificate at that point, it has the surrogate and the genetic father on it. Then I do a voluntary termination of the surrogate's parental rights. That's under chapter 261. If I get a birth certificate after that, it has just the genetic father on it. Then I do a step-parent adoption under chapter 289. And if I get a birth certificate after that, it has both parents on it. But they've gone through three statutory chapters, three different legal proceedings, 
and a complexity that shouldn't exist. But that is the spectrum of how it's done in the United States. I can't give you one law, and I can't give you one process. What I can say is that everybody that has established their parentage in the United States from any country has gone through a process that very likely and certainly has afforded everyone due process and protected the rights of the parties. That's the end of my 10 minutes. So I'm going to sit down now. <laughs>